Good morning. My name is David from 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. Earlier today, I got the itch to revisit Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church, which is just north of Milwaukee. Uh, with this channel, I've done several church visits related to Protestants, Catholics, Latter-day Saints, but I've only done one Orthodox Church. And after receiving multiple requests to do more, I figured this was the weekend to do it. So with this particular Greek Orthodox Church, I visited this for the first time eight years ago. And if you want to read about that visit, feel free to read my book, 52 Churches in 52 Weeks on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description box below. But when you first see this building, it looks like a retired UFO. It was one of the last works of the famed architect Frank Lloyd Wright. His wife actually grew up in the Greek Orthodox faith. So when he asked her advice what to focus on, she said to focus on the cross and the dome. So what Frank Lloyd Wright did is he built this golden cross on the very top of this flattened dome. And then on the inside, he designed the floor plan to look like an equilateral Greek cross. Well, as for Greek Orthodox itself with the faith, uh, it considers itself to be free of error, and it traces its lineage back to the very first church founded by the apostles. Uh, the church also prides itself on its divine liturgy, which was founded in the fourth century, and it consists of the Koine Greek language, which was one of the original languages of the New Testament. Now, when I visited this eight years ago, I walked out extremely perplexed and confused. Uh, the movements, uh, there were so many whole, you know, Holy Trinity type of uh, sign gestures, and also just with the foreign language, I didn't quite know what to make of it. Now, after doing several more church visits under my belt and finding appreciation with a Ukrainian Orthodox Church and also Latin Mass for Catholic churches, I was very curious to see what my reaction would be eight years after visiting this for the first time. So I'm going to share what it, this Greek Orthodox Church sounded like and looked like inside. I'll be back in a moment to share my reaction in just a few moments. As a returning visitor, trying to encapsulate the essence of a Greek Orthodox Church or an Eastern Orthodox Church in general can prove to be very challenging uh, because it's a very multifaceted mystery, a spiritual beauty of sorts. Because when you go, no member of the church is going to volunteer details about the actual physical beauty of a church like this. Uh, for many, if you are a regular attender, like you're just so accustomed to the church, it's not, no longer novel to you. For me, visiting this for a second time, I could see different aspects of the physical beauty blending into a spiritual beauty of sorts. Because walking into the building, like it is this magnificent architectural marvel. And then you have these vibrant visuals and the rich symbolism throughout and then on top of that, you blend that with the divine liturgy, with all these gestures. 
and the foreign language in the chants and the music and the psalmodies and you combine that and it's just with the foreign language it, it's it's a little difficult though to really get a firm grasp on everything that's going on because when you're hearing a different language you just don't understand it this had so many, this one had four languages from what i was told later on and and that pre presented a bit of a challenge to understand the full scope of this but there there also is that mystery where it is actually beautiful where sometimes you don't know what you're hearing and it just tunes your ears in even more i think one thing that i w haven't seen before was just the and i've seen this with roman catholic churches especially with latin mass but for the greek orthodox church here there was so much reverence with the preparation for the Eucharist. Um, there was a golden screen, like this golden gate that was shut during the pre-service matins service. And I didn't even know when they opened that up, but they eventually opened it. And that's when the deacon brought in the, the gospel. And I couldn't even really tell it was a gospel because it was the, I'm guessing this was the Bible, and it was just in this, bathed in this golden ornate cover and at one point everyone came up in the congregation to it looked like to kiss it uh, just just that reverence just that action uh, that I don't typically see in any other type of church so again this is where where the mystery comes alive for this but as we all know beauty fades and visiting this church for the first time in eight years uh, it, it was a bit, it was a bit depressing to see the building and the surrounding area around here uh, ha has fallen. I wouldn't say fallen apart, but there was definitely areas that needed improvement because at the very front there's a equilateral Greek cross in the very front by the street, and it was several parts of it had been chipped off, and were just laying on the ground. Uh, private property signs were all over the place to thwart any type of trespassers. And then also, uh, you could see the, the building itself, there looked like to be water damage up near the dome, and then also inside with the carpet. So it was frustrating to see such a, a marvelous building, and it's, it's no longer in its prime. It is long overdue for some type of renovation. And with these older church buildings... Uh, especially with aging congregations, I can't imagine the amount of money that needs to go into any type of church renovation. Uh, but the one promising aspect of this, and I don't know how in the world just randomly showing up for this Sunday service, uh, they actually had a gentleman who had flown in from LA who will be heading a strategic vision committee and will be working with the church to kind of see where they go from here. Because it, it, I can see this church building falling in further repair, and that will thwart congregation members from being a part of a church like this. And one thing with this particular one is this had a very healthy age range for this church. So I'm gonna try and get into that and uh, just different parts of this service in a recap. Uh, I'll do my best, especially just trying to, to communicate a service where it's not all in English. Online, it said the service would start with a pre-service called a matins at 8 a.m. So I drove out. I got there a little late, maybe about 10 or 15 minutes, and I was surprised at the lack of amount of cars in the parking lot. So when I walked in, there may have been five or six people seated in attendance. So I saw this spiral staircase. I walked up that into the balcony and it was completely empty. In the back of my mind, I was wondering what had happened because eight years earlier, I attended the pre-service called an orthos. Uh, a number of people were in attendance for that, but this was a fraction of that. So I listened to this lady who sang all these psalmodies. Uh, also, the deacon behind this golden screen would also chime in with a few chants. And I was taking a few pictures, and then eventually, a gentleman in a green shirt walked up the balcony. And we must have been about 20 yards apart, so it must have felt like an eternity for him to walk up to me. 
to introduce himself. But he was such a blessing because this left a very positive impression for me, even due to the awkwardness of us just being completely alone in this balcony. Because he he asked if I was new. I told him, yes, I was visiting. I wanted to learn about Greek Orthodoxy. And he helped me understand that the deacon was Romanian. So there'd be parts of the service where they'd be singing in Greek, they'd be singing in English, and then also they'd be singing in Romanian. He also uh, helped me with the Divine Liturgy hymnal and kind of gave me an idea of where to start uh, so I could follow along. So really, really helpful. And then eventually, as the Divine Liturgy at 9 a.m. came closer, the church began to fill up. And I would say this was a very healthy church with a very wide age, age range. They even had a little choir uh, up in the balcony with me. So they started to sing. And just all the different movements, there, several altar boys. And just a lot of this, again, was, was such a mystery to me with the timing of things and the movements. And just the iconography that was used throughout for the divine liturgy itself, again, this is where the, the multifaceted mystery and the spiritual beauty kind of blends together for me, even though I can't really describe it. Uh, I do remember the deacon walking in at one point. Uh, he had the this golden ornate Bible cover as he lifts it above his head, uh, surrounded by altar boys with all these candles. Uh, I also remember a lot of Lord have mercies. Uh, at the beginning of this service. Um, and also just with uh, Father, Ho Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, with the Greek Orthodox Church, I've never seen so many of these gestures uh, throughout an entire church service. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting was the homily. So uh, the deacon came out and during the homily, he actually has a cross that he holds to his heart the entire time that he spoke. Also, and this is probably the, the biggest mystery to me, is towards the end with the Eucharist. So there's this giant big chalice, and he had like uh, this red cover over it. Um, I was trying to do some research. It sounds like it's called an air, if I'm saying that right. So he comes out, and eventually um, one by one by one by one by one, is the distribution of this. With this air, it's like this red curtain-like cloth. And as every member comes up, they kind of place this cloth underneath their chin. And then the deacon, um, it almost looked like metal chopsticks to me from my angle, is he's feeding the congregation members. And I didn't know exactly what that was. Was it the body? Was it the blood? Was it bread and wine? Was he dipping bread in the wine in the chalice? I couldn't really tell. So this took a very long time. And again, this is something that I've never seen before where the distribution of the Eucharist is so individual because I'm so used to seeing uh, you know, lines or people seated at like an altar uh, type of rail of some sorts, but not here. And not only that, but... Uh, age didn't matter because they were giving this to babies as well. So this took, I want to say, at least 15, 20 minutes for the entire church to receive um, whatever was in this chalice. Again, I'm, I'm thinking it was communion. Uh, eventually, uh, and before this even happened, uh, the gentleman in the green shirt uh, walked up to me one last time just to ask if I had any questions. And one of the questions I had was why we're all why, why was everyone going through these doors on the side? Why weren't they going straight through this open area? And I didn't even realize, but the gentleman in the green shirt mentioned to me, oh, only the deacon is allowed to walk through that, that space. All the altar boys, anyone else has to walk on the side with the doors. So I didn't know that until he pointed it out. But uh, after the Eucharist, um, you know, he said a few words, and then he also invited a gentleman from L.A., who was in charge of the strategic vision committee. And he just said a few words about what they were planning to do to make it as in encapsulating for this congregation as possible for where they saw this church going forward. 
And, and to me, like, and what I appreciate that he mentioned is, you know, he did kind of briefly touch on the building. So if you're trying to bring people closer to Christ, you want to have the facilities to easily do that. And, and I can totally see with the, with this building, again, it needs a little bit of renovation, but how much are the costs? How much is the overhead for such an immaculate building like this? So afterwards, everyone, I guess, was going to go across the street uh, for their, uh, I'm guessing, like a, a luncheon afterwards. And this is when uh, the deacon, it looked like he was handing out bread. So this is, again, where it's like, was he serving the wine in the chalice and then afterwards the bread? Or was this just like bread for the lunch? I'm not really sure. And again, this is where... It, no matter what type of research that I've been doing afterwards, I would love your comments to kind of help me understand this a little bit better. So that way for people that are watching this video who are also curious uh, or even curious to attend a Greek Orthodox church for the first time themselves, fill us in because we'd love to know. So anyway, that was the end of this Greek Orthodox church visit. Afterwards, I did get to speak with the deacon real briefly. And he had this like, Pedro Pascal look, uh, the actor from The Last of Us and The Mandalorian. And one thing, this will probably sound silly, I could not believe just how he didn't lose his voice because he was chanting these deep, deep chants for close to two and a half to three hours. So how he didn't lose his voice, I don't know, but he was sweating profusely. And I totally understand that because with... Like, it is a workout for these deacons or priests who are doing all these movements, and then you are completely in charge of the service. Not only that, but during his homily, unfortunately, there must have been some kind of medical episode, and he had to postpone his homily to kind of give some insight and to help uh, someone that was, I don't know what was happening, but it created a little bit of a stir during the service. So he had to have full control of this church service by himself to make things run smoothly. And boy, did he ever. Tell you what, that's going to wrap up this week's visit to Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. As always, if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe to stay tuned for future visits. But until next time, hope you have a good one.